I am so thrilled that you're going to have the opportunity to hear the word that you're going to hear today. Of course, I'm going to hear it for the second time. But if I were to ask you about people in your life that you've watched them through the seasons and they've inspired you, how many of you can think of somebody who's kind of inspired you, right, as you've watched through the seasons of their life? Well, today this man has inspired me. And in some ways, I might not, might not be who I am today had he not launched me the way that he began to influence me when I was in my teenage years. He's Dr. Stephen Mansfield to many people. He's a New York Times best-selling author. Uh, he pastored a church larger than this uh, for years. He now has a company called the Mansfield Group, and he produces high-quality books for influential leaders who may not have the time or may not have the capacity to get out the message that's in their heart with the quality that they want to get that message out. He travels all around the world speaking to men, Speaking to leaders, he has a real grace on his life to make all of us understand that our private space is really, really important. But to me, most importantly, he's been a dear friend for over 44 years. So would you welcome with me today, Dr. Stephen Mansfield. Please sit down. Please sit down. Please sit down. Thank you. Thank you. All that was Jim calling me old. I launched him, we're the same age. Man, I'm having a moment. Jim and I have known each other for 44, 45 years, but somehow in my head it didn't register. And this morning I got on an elevator and there was a baby carriage on there the size of a minivan. I'm telling you, you know how these, these suckers have gotten huge, haven't they? And the person, you know, driving this thing with a tractor said, these are Jim's grandchildren. Heck, I didn't know he was married, much less had grandchildren. I mean, I just, some, some just, I've missed something along the way. So it's so good to be with you. I love this church, love being back with my friend. So proud of you guys, pray for you all the time. I had a weird experience uh, yesterday when I drove into town. You know how we all obey our GPSs, right? If it said, stop in the middle of the road, get out and run around twice and get back in, we would just do it. We just do whatever the GPS says to do, right? And... Um, so I drove into town. I've been here before, but, but they put me in another hotel this time. Fine. Uh, so I had the address and I GPSed it. Well, what it told me to do was exit onto Navarro Street. And then, then it said, go under the overpass and do a U-turn. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'm, I'm, an, I'm an obedient guy. So I did that. I'm going, I don't know which direction. I was going west on Navarro. Can you go west on Navarro? I'm going west on Navarro. I get under 77, right? That's the one that goes over. It says, do a U-turn. I did what I hope was a legal intern, for those of you carrying badges. And, uh, and then when I'm under the bridge in the middle lane, it goes in that classic GPS voice, you've arrived. <laughs> That's what it said. I'm in a middle lane, people honking at me, I'm under a bridge. I'm thinking, Jim did not intend that I sleep under the bridge. I'm pretty sure about that. <laughs> what in the world? Well, I can't sit there, you know, even a, even a policeman looking at me like, move on. So I, so I went down tomorrow. I guess I was going east at that point, turned around, came back. I thought, I'll give this GPS a chance to reset. So I, I came back around the other way. Oh, no, same thing. Turn around. And she wanted me to do it in the middle of the road because she's evil. This, this GPS voice is evil. Do a U-turn, she says, like right here. And then again, in that even a more delighted voice, I heard it as an even more delighted voice. You've arrived. <laughs> well, finally I realized the address of the GPS wasn't going to get me anywhere. So I got on the phone and called the hotel. And I, you know, I'm making, making light of it. I'm sure they get these calls, I guess. I don't know. Um, and so I, I said a few things. And I joked about being a Yankee and lost, you know, all that kind of stuff. And you could tell she, was, she had learned to go slow with idiots. You know what I mean? <laughs> she had learned, Yankees, little idiots, whoever, sir, we're so glad you're in our city. She said, I'm like, I'm in trouble now. And finally she explained where the hotel was, which was a mile away, I just have to say, from where, well, you can tell I'm setting up a sermon. And that is that sometimes you don't have the information to get where you need to go. And I certainly didn't have the information yesterday, that's, that's for sure, even though I've been here, gosh, 15, 20 times. And I imagine 
I, I know that I often feel in life the way I felt yesterday in that car. I'm supposed to be somewhere. I'm supposed to have a map. I'm supposed to be directed. But, but, but circumstances are weird. And you don't need to be told because you're a well-taught people, a well-educated people. You're paying attention to what's going on in the world. That we are as much wonder and beauty and happiness as there can still be in this life. Still, we are living in some strange times. Right? We are living in some strange times. The trends in our times, apart from trends in the kingdom of God and the church, uh, they, they are strongly towards the immoral, strongly towards hatred, strongly towards violence, uh, strongly towards discord and upheaval. And you don't need to be told that. You've watched the events, not just of the last couple of weeks, but, but maybe in your entire, our entire lives, we've had some element of that. And it can be discouraging. It can bring depression. Watching the news, we can just feel something almost, I don't mean to be weird here, but almost like it's crawling out of the TV and getting on us in a sense. You know what I'm saying? You kind of, kind of watch the TV and you go, man, I was doing better before she came on the air, you know, and, uh, and, and, that, and just kind of a heaviness. Well, I want to address that today because I live my life a lot uh, in the corridors of power. Jim's already introduced me. Uh, I don't mean I'm powerful. I mean I advise people and walk around. And I've I, I, I'm, I'm got my face up against it a lot with what's going on in the news. And, and, and I'm aware that you can't bring change to this world if you are under the forces of this world. I don't mean like you're being sinful or immoral. I mean even if you're just under the heaviness of this world. And so I want to talk to you about a verse that in the Bible is used to pivot from a description of the kind of darkness that we're living in. But also, I believe today, if we will embrace it and take hold of it in faith, as we were urged to do earlier in the service, I believe it can bring some powerful release for us so we can be who we are called to be in this generation. And let me say something to you right up front, and that is that I don't believe the fact that we are here is any accident. I don't just mean in this room. I hope that you don't curse the time of your life that you are here for such a time as this, that you live at this time. Let's, let's, let's just get it right out in the air. We may be living in some difficult times, but we are living in destined times. And you've got to embrace the fact that you were destined for this. You were made for this. In fact, let me give you a little encouragement, which I didn't give the earlier service because they're all backslidden and whatever. I'm not going to talk to them. No, I'm just playing, just playing. I probably shouldn't have said that on camera. But anyway... Uh, in Galatians 4.4, 4, we are told that Jesus came in the fullness of time. You've read that, right? We normally read it around Christmas. Fullness of time. Well, I won't take time as a historian to break that out for you, but the times in which Jesus born were horrible and violent and bloody and ugly. The elderly were supposed to commit suicide and babies were exposed on walls. If the father didn't want them, he could just go thumbs down and a baby would be carried out to the city walls and exposed. I could go on and on and on with the violence and the ugliness and the idolatry and the persecution and the demonic religions. And yet God says through Paul in Galatians 4.4, 4, this, this was the perfect time. It, in fact, it actually means in Greek, the times were pregnant. And what I want to say to you before I go any further today is that you may be saddened by what's going on in our generation. You may be grieved, and I hope you are. I hope you're able to weep with those who are hurting and around the world and what's happened in Israel and what have you. But I want you to know the times are just as pregnant now with possibilities for the victory of the kingdom of God as they were in that first century when God spoke about Galatians 4.4. They are Presbyterians, aren't they, Jim? I, I don't know. I went, I went to a Presbyterian seminary. I've never, no, I'm just playing, just playing, just playing. I guess I need to tell you what I told the first service. I go to a church in D.C. that's 90% black. Cool in the gang leads worship. You follow what I'm saying? I'm used to people jumping up and slapping high five during the sermon. So don't you sit there and wipe me this morning, Okay. I'm having more fun than I ought to have in church. <laughs> Our times today are very much like the times that the author of the book I'm going to look at this morning, um, his times and the reason he wrote his book. Uh, the, person, the author I'm talking about this morning is John, the disciple of Jesus. 
And this, this book, 1 John, you can turn there if you, if you want to. They'll get the scriptures on the board on, on the screen, I'm sure. But uh, this is written at about 95 A.D., nine, the 95, not 1995, but 95 in the first century. I love John. John is the, at this point, at 95, he's the only disciple of Jesus who's still alive. He had a revelation of Jesus' love for him when Jesus was even walking the earth. And that's why John calls himself, in the books he wrote in the New Testament, the disciple Jesus loved. He, he sometimes wouldn't even use his word. He wouldn't even say I or I, John. He would just say the disciple Jesus loved. He's the one who laid his head on Jesus' chest and during the Last Supper when Jesus said, I'm about to be betrayed. Trying to comfort him, trying to get close to him. My favorite scripture about John, of course, I love John for many reasons. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote the book of Revelation. He wrote, wrote for 2nd and 3rd John. Love him for all that. He's the one that Jesus, by the way, so trusted that from the cross, he turned to John and said, uh, John, this is your mother. And he pointed to Mary. And he pointed to Mary, his mother, and said, this is your son. In other words, you take care of my mother. I, I mean, just, just close. But I have to admit that my favorite verse about John is when the women have come from the empty tomb and they've announced to the disciples who are in hiding uh, that Jesus has been raised. And, the, and, and John, who's writing in, in the Gospel of John, uh, later recounting this, he says, Peter and I ran to the tomb. And then just like a knit with male, he says, and I ran faster than him. <laughs> That's what he said. Something Jim and I would do, Right. Something, something real important like the resurrection of Jesus is happening. But I'm going to take time to tell you that I outran him. Which, by the way, in Jim's and my case would not be the case. He would outrun me. But all that to say. But I'd be blocking for him. I'd be blocking for him. I just have to say. So I love John. And John is dealing with times that are a lot like ours. There's persecution. 95 AD. There's, there's, there's violence. The gladiatorial games are happening, the things you've seen in movies and so on, vicious, violent, just for entertainment. People are being killed by wild animals and, and, and in contests with swords and tridents and things like that. You've, you've seen the movies, you know what I'm talking about. The society is evil, it's idolatrous, demonic displays are happening all the time. In 1 John, he has just mentioned, just before the verse I'm going to land on, he has just mentioned that the Antichrist is loose. An Antichrist spirit is really what he says. And so that's happening, an Antichrist spirit is happening in our time as well. There's division in the church. Leaders are sometimes weak and not, not, not le leading valiantly. There are heresies dominating. I mean, it's a difficult time. And I imagine that John, living in 95 AD, might have thought, man, if, if I didn't have such confidence in the Holy Spirit, this is, this is the time you might wonder if the faith's going to die out. I mean, it's being persecuted. It's small. People are falling away. The Antichrist spirit is working against them. There's division within and without, all that kind of thing. So John is describing what's going on outside the church. He's describing what's going inside the church. And then he comes to 1 John chapter 4. And in 1 John chapter 4, he pivots. He starts giving us the solution. He tells us what we need to know to break free from the forces that are loose in the world, that if they work into our lives, can keep, up, keep us from being the people we're called to be. And I love these words, and I know that you'll want to make me feel welcome this morning. I'll quote it the first time. After that, every time I quote it, well, it's going to be 900 times, you quote it with me, okay? Just jump in and preach this sermon with me. Because in 1 John 4.4, 4, John, having described all the things that I've now described, not only in our time but in his, he says... But you, talking to believers, but you are from God, little children. You're from God. And have overcome all of this. And I'm sure at that point they're going, really? But here comes the operative phrase. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. I'm going to do it again. Now you've got you to do it with me every time. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Let me break out this, let me break out this sentence real quick. Because I want us to really live in this and stoke in it here for the next little while. There's two halves of this sentence. Greater is he who is in you. And I hope you know, and I'm sure you do because you're well taught here in this church, that when you become born again, when you give your life to Jesus, when you acknowledge that he died for your sins, was raised again, when you welcome him into your life and, de and determine to follow him and live uh, Christ's life, 
The Bible tells us that the Spirit of God comes to live in your life. The parallel in the lives of the disciples to this experience that we have is in John 20 when the disciples see the resurrected Jesus and what does he say to them? Receive the Holy Spirit and he breathes on them. That was, that was an example in their lives of the spirit that comes to live in our lives. So when we get born again, when we become Christians, when we become believers, use whatever language you want to describe the same facts. When that happens, the spirit of the living God comes to dwell in us. Then, oh, we're, we're going, we're getting there, come on, before long. I think Jim cursed us with that Presbyterian thing, and I intend to break it. That's what I intend to do. And I went to a Presbyterian seminary. So all that to say, then the Bible tells us that in addition to the Spirit of God that comes into our lives because we're born again, then there's a thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And for the disciples, uh, Jesus said, listen, I'm going to send to the Father. You go wait in Jerusalem until the Spirit comes in power. And this is the power of God in our lives to be witnesses in the world, as Jim was just talking about. This is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you remember it, Acts chapter 2, they're all gathered in the upper room. The Spirit of God comes. There's a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Tongues of fire appear. And they're all baptized in the Holy Spirit, speak with other tongues and all that kind of thing. And Jesus had already told them, you will be my witnesses when the Spirit comes in power. So we have the Spirit operating in our lives, not only because we're born again and the Spirit of the living God comes to dwell in us, but also because there's an endowment, to use the King James word, there's a, there's a coming upon us of power, so that we have power to be witnesses, power to proclaim the gospel, power to see the, go the captives set free. And when you look at it in that way, that first part of what John says, greater is he who is in you. Let's just pause there. And it's very, very important that we know that the Holy Spirit of God is a person. He's not static electricity. He's not goosebumps. He's not just for church on Sunday morning. It's the Spirit of the living God. And when you read the New Testament and start paying attention to the Spirit of God on the inside of you, it literally says, that same, if that same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and then it goes on to say you'll be changed in various ways. Come on now. I, I'm not, I'm all for goosebumps, I'm all for good feeling, but I want the spirit of the living God living in me. And I like the fact that John says he who lives in you. Let me keep going. The second part of this verse is that greater is he who is in you than he, now we're talking about a different he, who is in the world. And there's a little problem with translation here. Let me break it out just real quick. It won't be hard. We have a little confusion because of our English words. In the Bible, there's a difference between the words used for earth or the planet and words used for the, the, the civilization of men on the earth. But we, in English, use the word the same way. So, for example, uh, we will sing a song that says he's got the whole world in his hands. Well, that's fine. We're not picking on anybody. It's, it's fine. But in the New Testament, in the Bible, there's a difference between the word that is used for the planet and the word that is used for the system of men on the earth. So, the, let me just make it very clear. The Bible says in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The earth is the Lord's. Let's not give the devil too much credit by saying he rules the earth. He doesn't. The earth is God's. It reveals him. Romans 1 tells us that it reveals his divine nature and eternal power. You know, when, one of the reasons you enjoy, you know, lakes and mountains and trees and I guess God reveals himself in vegetables. I don't believe it personally. I'm just saying, but I, it's possible that that happens to some people. But, but my point is, why? Because he created it and it reveals him. But the, so that's, that's the earth. The Greek word is geo. You know that word. It means, it means the planet. But there's a completely different word for the system of men on the earth. And it doesn't matter what the word is in Greek, but the important thing is that when the Bible uses the word world or worldly, it's talking about the demonically inspired evil system of men on the earth. That's why this verse says, greater is he, Jesus, who is in you, than he, the devil, who is in the world. Two different he's. Same pronoun. Because there is a system, really the New Testament word is arrangement, 
There's an arrangement of fallen men, demonically inspired, on the earth, and you see it all the time. The violence and the hatred and the terrorism and the, and the race the hate and the shootings and the stuff. This is evil. This is the enemy. This is the devil messing with human beings and building a system of fallen men and women uh, who, who, are, who are demonically inspired and doing evil in the world. And that's what we're watching on the news a lot of times. And that's what we're reading about. And that's what we're dealing with. Well, what I love is this. This verse, 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, probably one of the last books John ever writes. He's probably writing in a little distress. He trusts God, but he's looking at a troubled church in a troubled age. And he says, here's the solution. Greater is Jesus who lives in you than the demonic forces that run this world that I have just described. That's what we need to know. And when you believe that, when it's not just a verse or a song, Jim and I went to a college where that was like a theme song. I, I, I probably didn't read that verse for some years just because I'd heard it so many times in the song. But, but I've come back to this verse, and i got to tell you, I walk around. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. You know how you just have to say it repeatedly, quietly. I mean, you don't stand up in the plane or in, you know, whatever and, at work and shout it. I'm just saying I'm saying it because it's got, it releases power in your life. Bible in John 6, 63 says that the words that Jesus has given us are spirit and they are life. What I want to do is wring the spirit out of all the words that I've, got, that I've got from the scriptures that are living in my soul. So now, having established what this verse means, let's apply it to our lives. Because I believe the Lord wants to set some people free this morning. Is it still morning? Wow, it's noon. I'm still legal for another 30 seconds. It's exactly noon. Some of you going, I'm hungry, I wish you'd hurry. Here I go, here I go, here I go. <laughs> I want to see some people set free. And this verse applies in seven areas. Now I know I just said I've got seven points. And I know some of you are like, we will never get to eat. We will never get to eat. I know how preachers, no, watch me, watch me. I talk faster than a Yankee on drugs, baby. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. Number one, number one. And you grab the ones that you need in your life this morning. This is meant to be, I'm having a little fun, but I want you to take hold of, what, of the power that's here to set the captives free. I love the verses in the Bible that say, the Spirit of the Lord hovered over the Word to perform it. He's here this morning to perform His Word. Number one. Number one, this verse, it's power, it's release of power, it's release of deliverance for you, frees us from the power of this world. Now in the New Testament, time and again, the power, the demonic power that's in this arrangement of men and women on the earth, evil, demonic, inspired, doing evil, idolatrous, it is described as a snake. It, sometimes it's hidden from you in the English, but it's, but it's there. You know the New Testament refers to Satan kind of like a serpent. But sometimes it's very, very pointed in the New Testament. And it's the idea that this snake and his kind of this motion is working its way, trying to work its way into your life, into your home. And one of the Greek words means something like anaconda. If you know anything about anaconda snakes, they will wrap themselves around a person and then squeeze, squeeze. And when the person you know, exhales, it'll squeeze, the person can't inhale. Well, that's what this spirit of the world tries to do. We sang a song, Breaking Depression, earlier. That's what that spirit tries to do. It tries, tries to bring depression. It tries to bring disillusionment. It tries to hook into the needs of your soul and bring you into sin and bring you to addiction. You know this because we've been battling this our whole Christian lives. But that serpent-like force comes in and tries to get its tentacles on you. And sometimes you can be way down the road in the Lord and you walk with the Lord and you're still kind of surprised that, you're, that you maybe think a thought or that something seems suddenly maybe appealing for two seconds. It's not you. It's the enemy, that snake-like spirit trying to come into your life and seduce and, and pull you away and bring you into bondage and, and probe at your wounds and, and, and hit you with negative stuff on television that bring, brings depression. And because the enemy is a coward, he comes in the night. He comes when you're alone. He comes when you're weak. That's the spirit that is in this evil system of men on the earth. And what's the answer? Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Power. You don't have to go, well, I, I don't, gosh, I, I, I don't know what to do in the face of this. No. Back off, spirit. Back off, voice. Back off. Greater is he that is in me 
than he that is in the world. If we don't believe this, if we don't walk in the power of it, I don't know how we get up in the morning. I really, I really don't. How do we get up in the morning in this age unless we walk out there with, the, with the, literally a temple of the Spirit of God on the inside of us that can defeat the evil stuff that comes against us? How would we dare send our kids off to school? How would we dare send our spouses or buddies off to work? How would, why would we dare let anybody get out of like a safe room in the basement of our house? You understand what I'm saying. The reason we can walk in this world and, by the way, change it is because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. we got to know it. It's got to be reality. It's got to be power in our lives. I don't want to just sing the song, believe me, you don't want to hear me sing. I don't want to just have the verse kind of up on my refrigerator. I want it to be releasing its power in my life. Power in my life. Number two, frees you, the truth of this thing, frees us from the fear that is in the world or that comes from the world. The devil is a terrorist. He wants to dominate you with fear. I have a theory that we all may have had some kind of fears before we were believers and, you know, the, the, the stuff that just happens in this life, you know, fear of water, fear of heights or, you know, what, whatever, uh, fear of small places, fear of Aggies, whatever. I mean, whatever kind of fear <laughs> is completely natural and understandable. But I believe many times when, we're, when we are believers, the enemy still tries to embed fear in our lives because where there is fear, he has control. Where there's fear, he has control. And I love the compassion of God in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 15. There's this passage that, I don't know, it just touches me that God said this. And he's bemoaning the fact that there are people who, through, here, here's the quote from Hebrews 2.15, through fear of death, listen to how God is expressing this in compassion, were all their lives subject to bondage. This is God talking. He gets it. He understands. There are people in this room, and I mean no condemnation in saying this at all. Believe me, I've had to battle things also and, and, and recurring episodes with things. But the enemy tries to plant fears in our lives, and we're embarrassed by them, and maybe they're stupid or maybe they're rational. I'm, I'm afraid of terrorists. I'm afraid of, uh, you know, Palestinians or I, I, whatever. Of course, I've, I've got many, many, many Palestinian friends who are vibrant, awesome people. I'm just saying that's what the news will try to portray. Or throughout history, people of a different color, or people who are Jews, or whatever, you know, north-south. I mean, heck, we fought a war over the difference between north and south. You know what I'm talking about. The enemy can inspire hatred and fear of almost anybody. But one of the things that I love, I'm going I'm to quote it a number of times as I speed up just a little bit here to take us to the close. So I've done, spent a lot of time in the Middle East, and I spent a lot of time with Middle East Christians. And most of the Christians in the Middle East, some are evangelical, some are Catholic, but some are Orthodox and deeply committed to Jesus and doing valiant stuff. Well, I was with them one time when they, were, when they were praying for someone, and I caught enough in the language, just enough that I couldn't quite get it right, but I just spoke, spoke a little bit of the language, and I, I thought I heard them say something, and I, so I asked one of their ministers, um, what were you praying? And what I learned was that while we, as sort of more like you know, charismatic uh, evangelical Christians, would pray the Spirit of God comes on to someone, and that's, that's completely biblical, the Orthodox have a strong belief that the Spirit of God is already in a believer, so their prayer is focusing on that Spirit of God in them arising. And so I was watching my friend, who is an Orthodox priest, uh, who went to ORU, by the way, the same college that, uh, that ORU, uh, university that Jim and I did. The priest would put his hands on the shoulders, and then he would do this. And he'd come back. And I said, what are you doing? Well, we're, we worked out this morning, man. You don't have, what, are you, what are you doing? I don't understand. He said, oh, no, that's part, of our, that's part of what we do. I'm laying hands on him, and I'm saying, whatever the need is, we believe the Spirit of God who meets that need is already inside. So what needs to happen is the Spirit of God arises and breaks the person free. Wow. Wow. Well, I mean, I'm not saying we have to go with that, those, those movements when we pray for people, but we need to be aware. It's not like they're out on some desert island apart from Jesus and we're asking the Spirit of God to come on them. They are walking with the Spirit of God on the inside of them. Arise, Holy Spirit, set us free, deliver us. And that's my prayer for you this morning. May the Spirit of the living God, that same Spirit who raised Christ from the dead, arise in you and break the fears that beset your life. Give you faith and peace 
and an end of torment. In the name of Jesus, and everyone said, amen. amen. Number three, it frees you from the lies of this world. We believe lies. We believe things passed down through our family lines. We believe things that the angry person said years ago. We believe stuff. I've told you here before, I'll just say it real quick. When I was in the sixth grade, uh, my teacher said to my mother in front of me, Stephen is immature and retarded. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Gigi, would you give me a hug? I, I just need to be, I'm just playing. I mean, that's, that's, that's harsh. But you know what? I believed it. I went on in my academic life and I, and my, in, in school until I became a believer. And I believed that Stephen's immature and retarded. Jim would say, well, you're not retarded, but you are immature and it's time to grow up. But I mean, whatever. And then I had to realize it was a lie. And since it was about my intellectual life, I didn't do well in school. And then when I became, and again, I got started breaking that stuff. Well, we believe lies. We believe lies about our family line. We believe lies about who we are or our ethnicity or our family or whatever. There are movies and books written about this. My wife and I, Bev and I, we have a lot of fun. We laugh a lot and play a lot. She couldn't be with me this time, but you'll love meeting her. Um, and she and I like uh, remembering some of the big lies that were sung in songs. My wife's a songwriter and producer in Nashville. And uh, some of the big songs that were, that were written that had unbelievable lies. For example, I mean, those of you who are old hippies, I'm going to take you back, all right? Get ready. Don't put on tie-dye and raise your lighters or whatever. I mean, that's not, don't, we're not doing that. But there was a song, real huge song, written by one of the biggest music groups of, the, of that era that said, if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. It's, it's the song that launched a million adulteries. If you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. What, kind, what sense does that make? That's crazy. That's an end of your marriage right there. <laughs> then there was a big movie that was a big, all heartthrob movie going on called Love Story. You know what the big theme of it was? Love means never having to say you're sorry. Men, give that a try in your house. I'm telling you, that's, <laughs> that's crazy. That's nuts. Never having to say you're sorry. I mean, that's like saying, well, you never have to repent. I mean, that's ridiculous. And I, I remember once when I was about 13, uh, in Germany, I picked up a German magazine. I spoke German real well back then, far better than I do now. And, and raised, I was raised in Germany and picked up this magazine, Der Stern, uh, their version of like Time or Newsweek or Life. And, I, and inside there was a picture of a model. And in German it said, uh, they'll love you when you're beautiful. Love you when you're beautiful? Picture a 12-year-old girl getting that message. Really? It's about makeup and, and showing skin and... What I'm wearing, that's what causes me to be loved. I think that kind of message has perverted an entire generation. Well, these are lies we believe. I remember once we were ministering with some guys, and they had told me about somebody they, had, they were trying to help, and the guy was mired in alcohol, and, and uh, he was trying to come to Jesus, but he, was, he had a struggle with alcohol, and I'm sure there was something biochemical, but they asked me to chat with him just a little bit because I take a slightly different approach, and, uh, you know, we all have our, our roles to play in a person's life, and, and uh, finally, I found out the guy was Irish. Well, some of you will know that Irish people are heavy drinkers. And this guy had come to believe that because he was Irish, he had to, he had to be in bondage to alcohol. He said, my grandfather came in falling down drunk. My father came in falling down, down drunk. I will too because I'm Irish. Well, that's a lie from the devil, man. That's a lie from the devil. There's, not, no, there's no bondage you have to walk in that Jesus can set you free from because you are a certain skin color or from a certain nationality or, or whatever, have a certain body type, that's ridiculous. And I, 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 I will tell you, this is one of the most unique ministry sessions I've ever had, because basically I just dogged you, I just laughed, laughed at him like we were sitting in the locker room. I said, are, I, I should have been more holy. I said, are you nuts? <laughs> Don't ever do that when you're ministering to somebody, but I was getting weary of the brother. You know what I'm saying? I just said, have you, have you lost your ever, okay, you know, where I, you know what I did, I, want, I don't have to relive the moment. Jim's like, don't teach them to do that just because you do it. <laughs> Bondage because of a lie. And I want to ask you real quick, are you believing in any lies about you, about your family, about your people, however you define that, coming out of an experience, something somebody said in anger to you at some point in your life, that is coming, that is being reinforced by that spirit that's in the world to destroy you? Because the Spirit of God on the inside of you is the Spirit of truth. He is the Spirit of revelation. 
and he will break the power of the lie in your life. Say amen. Let's move on. Amen. Number four, he will also free you from the damage. I'll say it quickly because you already know this. This world hurts. This world dents and cuts and de deforms. This world has its pains. Thank God that they don't have to be permanent. Thank God that Jesus can heal us and restore us. And so the fact that he's living on the inside of you delivers you from the deformity and the wounds and the crushing of this life. But you've got to turn and acknowledge it and ask him to do it because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Now, everything I've said thus far is exactly true of you as an individual, but there's something I want to say real quickly about this verse I haven't told you yet. And that is that the word you, even though everything I've said about you individually is true, the word you there is not singular, it's plural. It's speaking to the, to the people of God. And so one of the things that is such good news is that when we become believers and God sets us in the family of God, we are embedded in a power network that is part of overcoming this world. In other words, I don't want you to go out of here thinking that you step out there and now it's me against the world because Jesus is on the inside. You have victory without question. Everything I've said is true and biblical thus far about that dynamic. But I'm saying something else. I'm not victorious against the world because I'm out there alone like the Marlboro man taking on all enemies. I got the body of Christ. I got a band of brothers. I got people who are gifted differently from me. I got, I got, somebody's got my back. You follow what I'm saying? I got, about, I got about two skills in my whole life. Like I'm a teacher and I got a gift for statesmanship and stuff like that. And I, occasionally I can write a book. I mean, I got a few gifts. I don't have all the gifts I need to live in this world. I don't have all of those things. I need somebody else to help me. I need other people with spiritual insight I don't have. I got a friend who has dreams of direction from time to time. Every so often he has them for me. Do you, you know, when I was young and stupid, I used to try to work up dreams. I would pray for an hour before I went to sleep. Lord, I want to have dreams. I want to have dreams from you. And all I did was get skinny. I mean, nothing ever came, right? I'd pray for revelatory dreams. I'd dream about pizzas chasing me down the road. What the heck? I don't even know what it means. My point is, it's not what I'm gifted for. Thank Jesus somebody is. Thank Jesus somebody is. Or moving me towards compassion for the poor. Or moving me towards evangelism. Or coaching me to be a better man. Or helping me have a strong marriage. Or helping me be a better parent. You understand what I'm saying? Help me walk in the gifts of God. I don't have everything I need. I don't have very much that I need. I need the power network of the body of Christ so I can stand against this world with them. With them. And what brings a lot of that power is something the New Testament calls the power of agreement. I love in the Bible, it's constantly saying if you're speaking the same thing, if you're in unity, if you're bound together and you're in unity, you can overcome. I like that. I like the fact that I can join hands with somebody and we can pray about their situation or my situation. Matthew 18 kicks in. If you pray as anything, about anything that's touching it, you'll have a pray in agreement and bam, power happens. Power is released. I need you, you need me, you need your pastors, you need each other. We are not meant to walk alone. And then finally, I love the fact that we're on mission. We're going, we're doing. The fact that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world is a commission. It's saying, since this is true, get into the game. Get out there. Maybe the Cowboys have a bye week, but we don't have a bye week. Let's get out there. You see how I did that right there? I just turned it right there. Anything Jim says, I can turn into a sermon. The point is, let's make a difference. If you're sitting home watching TV and griping about the news, well, no wonder stuff's starting to crawl into your soul. You join hands with other believers and decide to take on the strongholds of our age. Now, baby, we're living the great adventure. And the Spirit of God shows up and the gifts and other people arise and victories start to happen. That's what we want. That's what we want. All right, two things just real quick. As I'm going through this list of seven, I'm keenly aware of the power of lies that might be working in some lives that are right here or maybe watching us on a screen somewhere. I'm also keenly aware of my reference to damage. Things hurt, griefs happen, lacerations occur, woundings occur. 
but the spirit of the living God is on the inside of you to arise and the spirit of God is on the outside of you to come upon you to set you free. So look up here at me. I'm going to close in a different way. May the spirit of the living God, that same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, arise in you now. May he drive off the lies that have held you and your people in bondage. May he reveal the truth, illuminating the scriptures and exposing the lie. And may you walk free. May he also arise and heal the damage in your life. Perhaps damage you haven't even attended to because you've been walking with it for so long. Spirit of God, arise in every vessel who's listening, watching this in the room. And heal the wounds and the deformities and the damage that we've sustained. Why? So we can get in the game and carry the gospel into our generation. And everyone said, amen. amen. Love you. Were you glad the greater one lives in you this morning? Huh? Ah. And I was just thinking back to, uh, a lot of you know this, that I'd never read the Bible through whenever my van broke down. I was going from Saxonburg, Pennsylvania, where I lived, to Tucson, Arizona. I had injured my arm my freshman year playing college baseball, and I was going to transfer to Arizona, better climate to, to rehab my arm. And my van broke down near Oral Roberts University. And I remember they played Arizona State in the College World Series a year before, so I thought, why not hitchhike and see if I can make this team? And I hitchhiked and I made the team. But I was just having flashbacks while Stephen was speaking. The first time I met him, y'all, is because I got in a fight on the basketball court. And I had to go see him. How many of you know that's intimidating to look at when you get in trouble right there? Six, five, whatever. His weight, I'd never say it because he may do something to me, you know? But, but I can just tell you that, you know, I was just sitting there thinking back to whenever I was just a student. And this is funny, but th the first time he was valuable in my life, I went to a, a small group at this college. And the guys were like squirrely spirituals. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Squirrely? Like, I'm th I don't know if I fit here. And so he said, what are you doing? I said, man, I want to play baseball here, but I don't think I want to live here. And he said, no, they're not all like that. Did y'all ever meet a Christian where somebody had to tell you they're not all like that? Then I remember a time whenever uh, I was going to just take out a loan to get through college. That's what you do, right? You don't have money, you just sign on the dotted line. He looked at me and he said, why would you do that? Why don't you believe God to, to help? If God sent you here, why don't you believe God to? And I thought, well, because I, I don't know how. That's why. And uh when he spoke that, he said, you know, God may call you to go to the mission field after you get done with your studies here. And if you're in debt, you can't just go to the mission field. And I thought, A, I don't want to go to the mission field. You know, but you know what I did is I ended up graduating debt free. And it was a miracle. People put money in my school account. I don't even know who they are to this day. Because when I lived my life, people bought into the purpose. And they thought, I see that poor kid. And then I thought back, guys, to, I used to run with him, all right? We used to go running together. And every time we'd finish, he'd say, let's go get a pizza. <laughs> and I think, what's the purpose of that? <laughs> I just ran to get trim, and, but I went and Godfather's Pizza, praise the Lord. I say that tonight because, listen, man, you know, sometimes... Man, you're just in the presence of God, and God does something. And tonight, I just want to encourage you that he's going to be here. 3.30, there's going to be, you know, cornhole tournaments, weightlifting contests, axe-throwing contests, all kind of good fun starting at 3.30. At 5 o'clock, we eat. Everybody say eat. It's not a men's meeting if there's not high-quality free food present. That's, that it, it must be at all men's meetings, right? And then at 6 o'clock, he's going to speak. And we had a hard time getting our schedules together. This is the only weekend he could come. And uh, when I looked, I thought, wow, the Cowboys and the Texans both have a bye week. This is awesome. I had no idea that the Rangers were going to be playing the Astros in game six. 
So my thought is, if he's a real preacher, come on, y'all. If he's a real preacher, I can put the game up right beside him while he's speaking. That's my thought, all right? And if he hears us cheer, he won't know it's because Altuve hit a home run. He won't even know it. Or if you're a Ranger fan because Corey Seager hit a home run, whatever. Yeah, I knew we had at least one Ranger fan in the house. To <laughs> but we aren't going to put the game up at 6 when he's speaking. But there is something called TiVo. And uh, I think you can record it as I will because I love what's in the games. But thank you for being in God's house today. Thank you so much for being here. Listen, yeah, let's give them all a good hand. And listen, I want to pray a final prayer really quick. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes? And if you're here today and, and you don't have assurance of salvation in your heart, you may think, well, man, if I did enough good works, maybe God would look favorably on me. But no, that's not it. Think about it. If good works could have gotten us to heaven, would have God subject his son to the cruel cross of Calvary? No way. The Bible says it's a gift. It's a gift that Jesus loves us. He forgives our sin. Man, where we messed up life, the Bible says he gives us new life. Where we're longing for life because maybe we were raised dysfunctionally. Listen, God's wisdom starts fixing what's wrong. And God doesn't just give us new life. He gives us abundant life. And then, most importantly, God gives us eternal life. And today, if, if you know that you need the life Jesus gives, man, you just want to say no to sin and yes to Jesus. Maybe you don't have assurance in your soul about salvation. You say, Jim, yeah, man, I'm ready to pray. I want that assurance. I'm going to count to three. Would you put up your hand on three? Ready? One, two, three. Shoot up your hand all over this place if that's you. Awesome. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, ushers. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Awesome. Well, would you look up? And church, let's put our hand in our heart with him. Let's pray this prayer. Let's say, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much for coming from heaven down to earth so we'd know how loved we are and how incredible God's ability to save any life truly is. Today, Lord, I say no to sin and I say yes to you. Thank you for the gift of life, I receive it with a grateful heart. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Well, hey, we're going to be baptizing people next week. And Jesus said, believe and be baptized. When you get baptized, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm part of God's family. It's the first step of obedience, and obedience to God will change your life. So if you want to be baptized, there's a salvation card on the seat back in front of you. Just grab it, fill it out. We'll contact you this week. Or they're going to put some information up on the screens. Guys, can we put that up right now? And let's just leave it up here for a minute. If you want to be baptized, you can use your phone and you can text in. But let's all stand our feet. I want to say this closing blessing over you this morning. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Great to be with you in God's house. Thank you for honoring God today.